Unemployment is one of the three main macroeconomic variables that help us get a better feel for the health of our economy. Along with GDP and inflation, we get a fuller picture of how our resources are being used. Is this guy out of work? Is he working part-time? Is he working full-time? How long has she been out of work? How long has she been looking? Is this woman choosing to be out of the workforce? Is she retired or is she inside the workforce? Some of these big trends are some of the most important variables that help us see where the economy is headed. We'll be looking both at the calculation of unemployment and the bigger, larger story of the meanings and the trends. So here's a sample problem. You've got 100 million people in the labor force, 200 million people in the total population. This many people, 97.5 million people, are employed so what is the unemployment rate? Well, you can practice this in your textbook, but the basic idea is unemployment rate is always the number of unemployed people divided by the total labor force, not the total population, because not everybody that's in the population is actively in the labor force. So labor force means everyone that's got a job and everyone that's actively looking for a job. So 97.5 million people employed, that means out of the labor force, 2.5 million unemployed. And the labor force is 100 million. So you've got 0 0.025 or 2.5% unemployment rate which is a pretty low unemployment rate for a country. That's good news. For a good reason, the unemployment rate is a very important number for the economy and for people predicting the future direction of the economy. It's, however, not the perfect measure. Um, it can overstate, at times, the true level of unemployment uh, because it simply takes time to find the right job. We want people to spend time finding the right fit. Uh, meanwhile, they are unemployed. and Especially in hard times, it can understate the true level of unemployment because, uh, quite frankly, if you've given up looking for a job because you just know there's nothing out there, you are no longer considered part of the labor force, and so you're not included in the unemployment rate. Because of the last point, economists have taken to looking at other measures alongside strictly the unemployment rate for a better feel for um, the severity of the unemployment problem. For instance, looking at discouraged workers trying to measure in the survey that um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses, uh, which they try to get a measure of how many people are have given up looking. Um, marginally attached workers are also uh, identified. Uh, so um, to be actively, to be considered unemployed, you have had to look in the last four weeks for a job. If it's been more than four weeks, but not more than 12 months, you're considered a marginally attached worker. So if you looked last, last time you looked for a job was five weeks ago, you're a marginally attached worker. You would prefer to have a job, but you are uh, simply not actively looking for one in the last four weeks. What if you've got a job, but it's not enough? Or you're vastly overskilled for the job you have, then you're considered underemployed, and this is typical of um, recessions and the aftermath of recessions. So let's look together at the actual data. If you go to the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics website, you can get all sorts of interesting takes on the unemployment rate. You can see the areas of gray are all recessions and as you might expect, unemployment rate increases rapidly, especially in the latest Great Recession, increases rapidly whenever there is a recession. And after the recession's over, predictably will decline as businesses begin to ramp up their production and begin hiring people back. What you see here is unemployment by educational level. And as you might expect, the lower the educational level, the higher the unemployment traditionally. And that holds true in recession and in an, uh, expansionary times. So the green line is the unemployment rate for those with less than a high school diploma. The red line is those for with a high school diploma only. The orange line is for those with a bachelor's degree and higher. And then the, the royal blue line is the
the average. And I'll let you draw your own analysis and conclusions from this graph, but this is unemployment by demographics. So you have um, African American unemployment, Asian American unemployment, Latino unemployment, white American unemployment, and then average unemployment for all groups. And you can see that although they all trend together, there are definitely uh, racial facets to unemployment in the U.S. still. And because it's true that unemployment sometimes overstates and sometimes understates the true picture of unemployment in the U.S., economists do look at other measures. This is one of the other measures that economists like to look at. This is the four-week moving average, so it's a little bit smoothed out data of initial claims. This is initial claims for unemployment compensation or jobless benefits. So the thinking is if more people are applying for unemployment compensation, which uh, pays out uh, when they are um, laid off, then that, that is a picture that more people are getting laid off and more people are without jobs. And here's a picture of total unemployment plus marginally attached workers plus those that are employed part-time for economic reasons. In other words, they would prefer a full-time job, but the full-time jobs aren't coming. So again, you'll notice that during recession, unemployment picks up. Unemployment plus marginally attached workers plus forced part-time work all tend to increase. And adding those together, you can see how steep the increase of the Great Recession 2008 is. One thing that's been particularly disturbing about the Great Recession and its impacts are the rise in long-term unemployed. So those that are unemployed for 27 weeks or over, um, you can see, a, again, a massive ramp up. And it's coming down, but it's coming down pretty slowly. There are a number of reasons to be concerned about this, but not the least of which is if you're out of work for that long, half a year to a year, your skills begin to atrophy, especially if you're at all involved in um, high-tech work, anything where skills sort of progress um, and you need to keep up maintenance of those skills. And the other problem is that there is a cap to unemployment compensation in the U.S. You don't get to collect it forever. So there's um, the end of 2013, there was uh, a Congress unable to progress on many decisions and weighed down by many other concerns, many of them political. And so long-term Unemployment benefits were set to expire for millions of Americans. They did get extended in the end. So that gives you a picture of how unemployment is calculated. But we need to know a little bit more about unemployment. Specifically, is there such thing as a natural rate of unemployment? In other words, if it's impossible to get the unemployment rate to zero, and policy should be aimed at keeping unemployment as low as possible, what is that number? The unemployment rate has never dropped below 2.9% in the U.S. Let's talk about why. There are three types of unemployment, frictional, structural, and cyclical. Frictional unemployment is the kindest sort of unemployment because it represents the searching costs of finding your perfect job. We want workers to spend time finding uh, the perfect job. We want employers to spend time finding the right worker. So the information just takes a while to process and that's why it takes a while for people to find a job. They're unemployed in the meantime um, before they figure out that this is the perfect job for him, this is the perfect job for her, and this is the perfect job for him. It's important to note that there is not an overall lack of available jobs. The second type of unemployment is structural unemployment, and this also exists even in good times. It has to do with the natural movements and churning of the labor market in technology, innovations, worker skills, etc. It goes something like this. Imagine that in the first year there was a fair amount of demand for high-tech workers, a fair amount of demand, those are hearts, for low-tech workers, but because of changing technology, there's going to be some churning. There's going to be some reduction in the love and resources, wages paid to low-tech workers, an increase in those paid to high-tech workers, 
unemployment rate should go up for the low-tech workers as fewer are desired by firms. But a reduction in unemployment over here for the high-tech workers. Over time we would expect some of these low-tech workers to go back to school, get retrained, match their skills better to the job market, um, but it takes time and in the meantime they're unemployed. A practical example of structural unemployment is what happened in East Germany after the reunification in 1989. All right, so quick check. Do you have the answer to this question? We're most likely to call Jasmine frictionally unemployed. So back to the idea of natural rate of unemployment. If structural and frictional unemployment are there pretty much all the time, even in good times, we consider them to be part of the natural rate of unemployment. So natural unemployment is no more and no less than what our estimation of frictional and structural unemployment is. Actual unemployment may be above that because there may be this additional type of unemployment called cyclical unemployment. That's the unemployment that's there during recessions only. Here's a look at the estimate of the natural rate. You can see it goes up and down, it's not as stable as you might expect, and during severe recessions like this last one, um, you can actually ramp up not only the cyclical unemployment, that's the um, unemployment due to the recession, but also you can sort of uh, churn up the labor market so much that it's harder for workers to find jobs even when there are enough because things have changed so rapidly. So you might consider that cyclical unemployment is unemployment due to the business cycle, unemployment due to those deviations away from our natural um, state. So GDP over time, if we think about that, is on average growing happily for the U.S. That's kind of been the way it is. But in the short run, we're either above or below it. Our trends, usually in recession, our GDP is below uh, average growth rate and this is when you get higher than average unemployment. So periods of GDP being slack are periods of higher cyclical unemployment. During good times you'd expect cyclical unemployment to be zero. Nobody's out of a work because of recession. So hopefully it's clear that we really need to know what the structural and frictional numbers look like so we know what our natural rate is so the policymakers have a target and they know when our unemployment rate is getting too high. Um, there's less we can do about um, unemployment that's high because of structural reasons, more that we can do with policy to cure high cyclical unemployment. Here are some of the things that can change the structural rate of unemployment. I would add that the rapid pace of new technology is creating quite a bit of structural change in markets and in some areas leaving workers unprepared for the jobs that are coming. And I'll leave you with one final graph. From The Economist, the curious thing that's been happening is the rise of long-term unemployment, the rise of short-term unemployment in the last few years has been coupled with a rise in corporate profits. There are plenty of different analyses of the causes and the impact of this. If you'd like to talk about this in class, we can. I'd also like to know what you think.